trained as a Western scientist, I came to feel that the worldview I was taught was too narrow, like a suit one had outgrown, and was searching for what the broader context for a Western science would be. And I've been working on that now for quite a few decades, and have come to the view that consciousness is not a late emergent product of a material evolution, but the exact opposite, the source of all material evolution. So I've come to believe that spirituality and science were separated only for historic reasons, and that it's time now to reunite them in a single worldview that can encompass the best of our spiritual traditions and the best of our scientific traditions. When you do that, as a biologist, as I am, uh, you come to a view of a living universe rather than this strange concept among human cultures that Western science came to, that we're an, in a non-living universe, a mechanical, celestial mechanics, if you like, that's running down by entropy and in which, by some miracle, life emerged from non-life, consciousness from non-consciousness, intelligence from non-intelligence, and those have been the stickiest problems for Western science. And while many Western scientists have convinced themselves that there really are explanations for uh, chemistry coming out of non-life and producing life, I did not find that satisfying. We have a new definition of life in biology in the last few decades called autopoiesis, which means a living entity is one that continually creates itself. This is very unlike a machine, which is created from the outside by an inventor, given its rules of operation and usually in a hierarchic arrangement, and has to be reinvented to have generations of technology rather than being able to reinvent itself in an evolutionary trajectory. So when I looked at that definition, autopoiesis, I said, well, what's the simplest entity I can think of that continually creates itself? And what I came to was a whirlpool in water. It holds a form through a constant intake of new water and lets out what it no longer needs. Very like a human body, we eat food, we drink water, we breathe in air, we continually renew all our molecules, cells, organs, and we hold a recognizable form through that process, letting go what we no longer need. So I began to see a continuity between the vortex form in protogalactic clouds all over our cosmos, the galaxy that we ourselves live in, the self-creation of Earth over time, which was initially a stardust ball of, of heavier elements, and then cooling on the outside, magma inside, began to turn itself inside out, magma coming through to the surface, then crustal plates forming and, and melting again into the magma as they move and shift. And if you could see a picture of Earth in uh, a few hours, as it's been from the beginning, you'd have no doubt that this is a living entity constantly changing and recreating itself and evolving ever more complexities. Three quarters of its life was devoted just to microbial life, and then the big multi-celled creatures came in. The Earth itself is like a giant cell. So that's our evolutionary trajectory now, is how do we globalize, meaning what? How do we shift a non-sustainable way of life to a sustainable way of life? If we know something is unsustainable, it means it can't last, and we have to reinvent it. So our job now is to see if we get a worldview in which we start with cosmic consciousness because no human has ever had an experience outside of consciousness and then recognize that our direct experience is always now and that reality has to be the sum total of human experience. How do we build a scientific model of that? You see, we can't build an objective model of the world out there. We can only build a model of our experience. And our experience at present is how to get out of crisis. 
Well, looking at living systems over time, I came to understand that they all go through a cycle that's very like our psychological maturation cycles. We start with a unity, we're undifferentiated, we come into the world new, and then individuation happens. We have many experiences, we branch out in many directions, and humanity, as it diversified and had more and more people, created more and more conflicts, exactly as the early Earth differentiated into bacteria, and then they developed different lifestyles, and they became competitive. They had invented technologies in order to carry out their hostilities. They created enormous problems, including global hunger and global pollution, and had to solve those eventually by negotiating differences, moving on around the cycle, and working out cooperative schemes that ultimately led the ancient bacteria that ruled for the first half of Earth's life to forming a new kind of cell as a community of different lifestyle bacteria working together. That's the nucleated cell that we're made of, that all these trees are made of, all the beings in the waters are made of. Everything we see around us are made of this wonderful big cooperative cell. So now humanity is going through the biggest event since the time that bacteria formed the nucleated cell because we're now trying to form a body of humanity around the globe. Seeing that other species matured out of a youthful competitive phase into a mature cooperative phase means everything to us now. The Darwinian story only goes to the adolescent part where there's competition hostile competition, you take all you can get, you, you fight your enemy, you try to outdo him or bump him off, and that's what makes you survive. But that's not what sustainability is all about. Sustainability happens when species learn to feed each other instead of fight each other, and you get mature ecosystems such as rainforests and prairies where they, you have far more cooperation than you have competition, hostile competition. You can still have friendly competition, but that's very different. So I see humanity doing exactly this now. We of the Western culture who divorced ourselves from nature, saying we're separate, that's nature out there, let's see how we can exploit it to our purposes. Uh, and interestingly, we're the species that invented the concept of entropy, and we're the one who creates it who deteriorates ecosystems while the other species are building them up. So we have a great deal to learn from nature. And by, by recognizing that our conscious experience is of other beings, is of teachers in nature that we can learn from and gain hope from. If bacteria could do it without benefit of brain, can't we as humans with big brains? In addition to this maturation cycle I see in evolution, it's also very important to recognize the embeddedness of living systems within each other. So our bodies are made up of cells within organs, within organ systems, within a whole body. And we can see that every level of this holarchy, these are holons within a holarchy, terminology from Arthur Kustler, and we can see that the self-interest of every level can be expressed and that what happens is that pushes negotiations toward a cooperative overall system. So self-interest is good as long as it's contained by the self-interest of a community. You see, that's, that makes us always be aware of other levels. And if we can learn this as humans to say when we're making a decision, is this good for me, for my family, for my ecosystem, for my nation, for my world? And then if it's good at some levels and at least harmless at others, like the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, then go ahead and try it. You're a creative human being. In evolution, we see that every time the Earth has had a huge crisis, like an extinction, then afterwards we've had an explosion of new life, not slow accidental Darwinian lineages, but an explosion of all kinds of new life, like the Cambrian explosion, where suddenly multi-celled creatures appear in the evolutionary 
record many different types at once. Or after the last extinction, when the dinosaurs went extinct, we see a flowering of all the different kinds of mammals afterwards. Not one giving rise to the other, but chains of them, many chains of them at once emerging. So human creativity now in our big crisis, and we are causing the latest big extinction. We're extinguishing creatures faster than that meteor that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. This is a big crisis, a huge crisis that we've created, and we have to let all the different cultures express their self-interest and their understanding of the situation. That awareness has to come about that, that the negotiations of the cycle can happen simultaneously among levels of a body or a world economy. We also have some practices in our world economy today that don't work very well, like genetically modified foods. You see, DNA is a worldwide information system, and genes, which are parts of pieces of DNA, are tradable among all creatures. My genes and the genes of this plant are interchangeable. I breathe in new genes all the time in, the, in viruses and bacteria and plasmids and prions. All kinds of them are flowing through my body all the time. And it appears that we have an intelligent genome. We know now there are what biologists call repair genes. When there's accidental damage to the genome, it's immediately repaired. Otherwise, these, these errors would build up and you wouldn't have, be able to function for a whole lifetime. So we now know there are editor genes when DNA is copied that make sure it's copied correctly, that there are repair genes fixing any damage done. So we again, we have to give up the Darwinian notion that evolution occurs through accidents and trust that the genome is intelligent. We see it's intelligent. We have 100 trillion cells in our bodies and each one of them has 30,000 recycling centers renewing our proteins. They're so high tech that they can take in a protein, disassemble it, build a new protein, perhaps a quite a different kind, and issue the new protein. That's as if we could stick trees into a chipper machine and get a live tree out the other side. Very high tech. We're not nearly as high tech yet as our own internal micro world. So we have a great deal to learn from nature. And take economics. If we ran our body's economy the way our world economy works, it might look something like this. You call the heart-lung system the northern industrial organs, and you give them ownership of the, the bones in which you mine the raw material blood cells that arise in the marrow. Sweep them up here to the northern industrial organs, purify the blood as actually happens, add oxygen, and then the heart distribution center announces the body price for blood today is so much, who will buy? And you ship the blood to the organs that can afford it, and not all can. This is the situation we have economically in the world today. And you can see that a living system can't function that way.